Mainers have always lived off the sea. First, coming seasonally for the fish, and eventually settling year-round. Once here, they also harvested the abundant timber along the coast to build their ships and boats. Soon, Maine became famous for its boat and shipbuilding, as well as for its fishing and trade. Generations of Mainers fished the waters and then carried their catch and their timber to markets along the coast or across the sea. Sons and sometimes daughters followed their fathers to sea, becoming fishermen, traders, shipwrights, and boat builders. Ralph Stanley was born in Bar Harbor, Maine on February 9, 1929, into a family whose island roots could be traced back to the earliest settlement times. I believe the Stanleys came to Cranberry Island about 1755 because the, the, uh, they were Grand Banks fishermen. And in 1754, the French were seizing colonial fishing vessels on the Grand Banks. And I think Stanleys shifted their fishing operation up on the main coast and they came to Cranberry Island and went back in the winter at Marblehead. A lot of came from Essex County, Massachusetts, Newburyport, and, and uh, Gloucester, and, and uh, Marblehead, Beverly, and Salem. Another bunch came from Cape Cod. I'm descended from about 20 of them, uh, the early settlers of the island. Dallas were fishermen for, for generations around here, and uh, they're seamen, and uh, they, uh, they traveled all over the coast. My father was a, a, a fisherman, lobster fisherman, and uh, he sailed some of people. Yeah, I went out with my father a lot and uh, on the boat and lobster fishing and, and trawling and, and hand lining. I worked on the boat too, painted it. I baited trawls. My father came southwest when he uh, was about in his early 20s, I believe, and he lived on Cranberry Island. My mother was a registered nurse. She uh, worked mostly at, at home raising the family, but uh, at times she took nursing jobs. With generations of salt in his veins, Ralph may have been predisposed to becoming a sailor and a boat builder. But his deep curiosity about everything around him would lead him to absorb and refine those skills and many others. He learned from everyone he could, and at times from those who had already passed on. I grew up in my grandmother's house. My mother's uh, father painted houses, and he also painted carriages that uh, some of people had, with the fancy varnished carriages with pinstripes and that sort of thing. He dusted for days when he got ready to varnish, and he wanted the air very still so no dust would fly around. And, had to get everything perfect. My uh, mother's grandfather, he was a sea captain, and uh, he had, uh, he was captain of several schooners. Uh, one was named the Brilliant, and uh, uh, one was named the uh, Pilot, uh, but the, the he had a three master named the Andrew Nebinger. He steered the schooner to Boston when he was nine years old. My father's grandfather, rather, had uh, seven different fishing schooners in Cranberry Island. These influences were not just male. Captain Mel Tyre Richardson, he married my grandfather's sister. And uh, she was his second wife. She had been to school in Boston, had more education than most people on Cranberry Island. And when she married him, she started going to sea with him. All his navigating had been uh, through dead reckoning. She quickly picked up navigation. And um, when she could figure out the, the courses and everything and, and knew where they were, why precisely, well, they made a better lot at a time in their travels. 
One of Ralph's lifelong friends is Albie Nelson. The two learned their seamanship together, of course from members of Ralph's extended family. Oh, I'd known Albie since I was a little boy. And uh, my father worked for the people. Chester Stanley, Ralph's father, worked for my grandmother. He started working for her, I think, in 1931 or 32. Chet Stanley was the captain, but he was more than a captain. He was far more than a captain. He'd forgotten more about the fishing and the ocean around here, the, the waters around here, than most people, including all the lobstermen, knew. He was a real seaman, and so was his uncle, whom we called Uncle Lou Stanley. And Uncle Lou taught both Ralph and me a lot about sailing. And there were more uncles. Ralph's great uncle, they called him Pa Jimmy, or Uncle, I always heard him referred to as Uncle Jimmy. And he owned three launches. Yet, for all of their seagoing skills, some of Ralph's family weren't so adept on land. Oh, Uncle Jimmy bought a, a car one time, a 1924 Essex, a two-door sedan. It was a real nice car. He bought it for $800. It was second-hand. And he bought it over at, at Clark's Point and, uh, by the steamboat wharf. He'd never driven a car in his life, so they showed him how to, to run it. And he lived over at Mansit at that time, and he... He drove the car uptown, made the corner perfect, and went down to Manset, made Manset corner perfect, and drove in his driveway fine, and drove into the shared garage that he had there, and went right out through the back end. My father was in the house with his uh, with his aunt. They heard the crash and went out to see what was going on, and the front end of the old Essex was sticking out through the back of the building. The wheels were still spinning, and uh, Uncle Jimmy says, Chess, he says, if you can get her out of there, she's yours. Of course, there's no knowing how good a driver Ralph is, but he certainly learned his seamanship, and his extended family fostered his interest in boats and much more. Ralph started drawing pictures of boats very early on, encouraged by his aunt, Alice Gilly, who had pictures of ships on her walls. By age four, Ralph was using these pictures as inspirations for his own boat drawings. Growing up, Ralph loved looking at real boats too, including a schooner that spent winters anchored in a nearby cove. And then there were the old wrecks that he liked to explore on shore, where he could see how they were built. But it wasn't all wrecks he liked looking at. Ralph would also sit at the shore to look at working boats floating at their moorings. I remember Ralph saying to me at one point, when um, I, I, I was asking him about how his interest in boats and building, he said, I've always wanted to do that. And he talked about a three-master schooner that used to come here, used to anchor right off this house. I remember seeing it. But as soon as Ralph heard that that schooner was, that old coasting schooner was up there, and he was quite small. I mean, he was three, four, he might have been five years of age. He got up there so he could look at it. I mean, the boat thing was really in his psychological blood. Ralph even talked his father into getting out the old Essex. Yes, that Essex to drive around to other harbors to look at boats. Ralph was always looking at boats. Still, Ralph's design interests were broader than just boats. Oh, I think I was interested as a, as a small boy in about everything. For a while I was uh, interested in airplanes and uh, I made a lot of model airplanes and uh, out of kits and, and, and sometimes I designed an airplane and made a model from my design. At age 12, Ralph designed and built an airplane with a 10-foot wingspan. He convinced his eight-year-old sister that it would fly. He launched the plane and his sister from the barn roof. 
It might be testament to Ralph's early boat building skills that both his sister and the airplane survived. Aunt Alice, who got Ralph into drawing boats, was related to him on both sides. She was his great aunt on one side and his great great aunt on the other. <laughs> no wonder Ralph developed such an interest in genealogy. Just keeping track of how he was related to whom would have taken some attention. But Ralph's real interest in family history came from his grandmother, Celestia Dix Robinson, who used to tell stories about the family and life in earlier times. I was always asking my grandmother what, what people were doing and, and who they were, and, and uh, uh, I wish I'd asked her more. Ralph is a walking history book. It's incredible what he remembers. It's an interest like the boat building that was always there. It always stimulated his interest. And I didn't know about this until later when he was building the Hieronymus. And we, we would talk, we got together to talk more about it. And, and well, so-and-so had this type of boat, and one of the Sperlings had this kind type of rig on his friendship sloop. And it, it would go on and on. It, it was just incredible what he knew, as, he, as a teenager even. I remember once he said to me, there are a lot of people in town who are descended from people who were on the Mayflower, but they don't know it. In other words, they didn't bother to confirm it. Whereas he confirmed it, he got interested in it just because it was history. And that led Ralph into the history of the area. That is, the context these people had lived in and how their lives related to the larger community. Even so, boats remained foremost for Ralph. By the time he was 12, he was baiting trawls for his father. Eventually, Ralph fished with him too. Chet fished year-round. In the summers, when he was also captaining for the Nelsons, he would fish early and work for the family the rest of the day. Ralph worked for them too, but after a year, at the age of 18, he started sailing for the Dunn family as cook and deckhand on the 43-foot schooner Nilaraga. Mr. Dunn, who owned the Nilaraga, uh, was tied into the Milliken family, and so Ralph just learned an incredible amount about how to manage that schooner. Eventually, he became its captain and sailed it for 19 summers. When he and his wife Marion married in 1956, they spent their honeymoon aboard the schooner Nilaraga. Sailing aside, designing and building boats remained Ralph's primary interest. Drawing lines came easily to him. And he'd been designing boats since about age 13. Then, when he was in high school, Ralph built a 15-foot dory. Uh, Clarence LeCount and I and Lester Alley used to go out and, uh, in the evening, some in the summertime, and row around Greenings Island. We had two pairs of oars, and Lester would set in the stern to trim it. In 1950, at the age of 21, he decided to build his first power boat, a 28-foot lobster boat. He started by carving a half model from which he could take the lines. Ralph would build the boat in his grandfather's barn, that same barn where the old man had varnished carriages and from which Ralph had tried to make his sister fly. Ralph had minimal training for this project, except for taking a woodshop class and a couple of drafting classes in junior high school, but he was ready. But I, I used to study the uh, yarding magazines and motorboating magazines, and they had a lot of designs and, and lines plans. And there were a lot of books that had lines plans of, of vessels and, and boats. And I studied those, and I, I figured out how to do it. When I started building that boat, I, I worked alone. I didn't have many tools, and uh, uh, somebody loaned me a big jointer plane, and, which was a big help, and uh, somebody loaned me an ads. I learned to use that. Oh, people gave me a lot of advice. I'd get stuck on something, and I'd, I'd 
go and look and I'd ponder about it and uh, sometimes I'd ask Raymond Bunker or Roger H or, or, or somebody what to do and how they would do it and they'd explain it to me and, and I'd visit all the shops around and, and see what they were doing and, and I'd learn a lot how things were done. His biggest influence was Raymond Bunker, who had worked at Southwest Boat until he started his own boat company with his partner, Ralph Ellis, in Manset. Interestingly, both men liked to sail. Mostly I, I could see what he was doing, and I'd watch how he did it. And I think he encouraged me to figure out how to do it. Many builders didn't care to explain how they did things. Some didn't want to share their knowledge, and some just didn't know how to explain what they were doing. Still, they didn't seem to mind letting Ralph watch. So, like many younger builders, that's how he learned to build boats. Ralph needed $150 for materials to start that first boat, so that summer he saved his sailing pay, and in the fall, he started construction. I got it planked up that first winter, and uh, the next summer I worked and got enough money to to uh, make a down payment on an engine and get enough materials to to finish it. And uh, I um, I got it finished, and I thought, well, I'm glad that's done. I'll uh, never have the courage to start another one. And two months later. A fellow came along and wanted me to build him a boat, and I couldn't wait to get started. Ralph designed, lofted, and made the molds by himself. And so, his career as a boat builder began. People been asking him to build boats ever since. In those early years, Ralph would sail his summer family from July to October, and he would build one or two boats during the winter. As for his own boat, Ralph used it for some hand lining, but never really did much fishing. The reason, he says, is that he was not strong enough to be a fisherman. He kept the boat for about three years till he was diagnosed with tuberculosis in the fall of 1953. He had part of one lung removed the next spring. Well, after I got out of the sanatorium, I, I, uh, it was in October and, and I kind of took it easy that winter and I helped her all the stand would build this little boat and uh, I also had wanted to make a fiddle, so uh, I went to work and made the fiddle. Ralph had learned how to play that fiddle a couple of years earlier while studying at Ricker College in northern Maine. There was a fellow up there that, that played the violin, and I thought, gosh, I wish I could do that. And uh, so I, when I came home, I, my grandmother had a violin, an old violin that I, I tuned it up and, uh, and I got so I could pick out a few simple tunes on it. And one tune led to another and, and that's how I learned. I, I just learned by, by myself. Like his interest in boats, Ralph's interest in music bent toward the traditional. Oh, I like old time fiddle music, old time tunes. A lot of my tunes don't go back to the Civil War and, and earlier. And I also play some newer tunes. and. Uh, when I'm playing with the Fry Mountain Band, it's country and western. When I made that first violin, I went to see a man over in Frankfurt, and uh, he was a violin maker. He was also a blacksmith, and, uh, but he'd made over 100 violins, and uh, he was in his 80s, and I went to see him. And uh, I asked him, what, uh, why, why did you get the wood? He says, Sonny, he says, there's just, just as good wood in your backyard as there is anywhere. Mostly the, the violins I've made, I've gotten the wood from whatever I had. Last one I made, I, I made from a, a, cher a cherry back and the cherry sides and neck. And the top was a spruce that blew down during a storm over on the Derrigo Road. I finished that one just a few weeks ago. Yeah, I've got three more underway. Maybe making that first fiddle was a way to keep his boat building chops while he was recovering from surgery. In 1960, Ralph got a special boat to build. I built the, the boat, seven girls, for my father, and uh, 
because he'd worked for the Nelson family at Northeast Harbor for, for years, and uh, they had me build the boat for him. She was 33 feet long, 10, 10 feet, 4 inches wide. I built her in the winter of 59 and 60. My father worked with me on that boat sometimes, and uh, and painting and, and uh, lifting things and, and helped me bend the frames in and that sort of thing. I think my father was pleased with the boat. Chet named it Seven Girls after his seven daughters, Ralph's sisters. He lobstered in it mostly, and of course sailed summer people too. When Chet died in 1971, the boat went out of the family. After three or four owners, it happened to be back in Southwest Harbor when it was badly damaged. She was on the mooring right off my place, and uh, a big Nova Scotia boat came along and uh, ran into her and stove the side of her in right down below the water line. And she was sinking fast, and uh, I got aboard of her and, and got my all the weight I could on the other side and to keep that damaged side out of water. And I hauled my rowboat on the side of it too to add weight and I hung out on the davy to add my weight and uh, that stopped uh, the leak a lot. Ralph bought seven girls from the owner and repaired it. I'm still using it. Doesn't leak a drop. In 1971, Ralph built a boat for a client who made him a bit nervous. He was a fisherman over at Stonington, and I found out afterwards that he had built a number of boats himself. And I thought, what kind of a mess have I got into? He, he does things different than I will, and, and uh, he'll find a lot of fault. But it turned out he was one of the best fellows I ever built for. He, uh, I'd, I'd save up questions, and how do you want to do this? and, and uh, he said, well, do it the way you want to do it. He says, you're building the boat. <laughs> and after I got the boat built, he, he, he wrote me a letter saying that uh, he never had anything that he appreciated more in his life. Before long, Ralph developed a reputation as a fine boat builder. At times, he had as many as three boats lined up for construction. And up in that old shop that I worked in, my grandfather's old paint shop, I built 27 boats in that shop and like to froze to death doing it. On a real cold day, it'd be down below zero when you went in and started the fire, and by quitting time, it might get up to 35. Today, Ralph's total is about 70 boats, ranging up to 44 feet. He is most proud of the work boats. At, at one point, uh, I had more boats fishing out of Southwest Harbor than any other single builder. That would be back in the late 60s, I think. Oh, I think it was, it was nice to build a workboat because the workboat would be out there working and earning money year round and, and, uh, and contributing to the economy. No doubt the quality of his workmanship is the key to Ralph's success. His ability to choose good materials and build a solid boat. And of course, the other element of Ralph's skill as a builder was his experience as a sailor and fisherman. He knew what these boats needed to do and what their owners needed in a boat, and he knew how to deliver that. He started with the obvious, asking clients how they would use the boat and what they wanted in it. Well, yeah, one fellow, he wanted the, uh, the deck just wide enough so that he could put his lunch pail endways on the deck because if you had to put it on sideways it might roll over and he'd lose his lunch. <laughs> Much of Ralph's success was in these details. Knowing to set the deck high enough so the fisherman's knee would hit below the combing, preventing injury and keeping him from pitching overboard in a rolling sea, and knowing that the steering wheel had to be low enough so that water on the helmsman's arms would run towards his hands and not up his sleeves.
Interestingly, in spite of his long experience building power boats, Ralph is now best known for restoring and building friendship sloops, once the mainstay workboat of the Maine coast. I like the friendship sloops because I, I like to look at them and uh, they look nice. And, uh, and uh, sailing one, they, they're easy to sail, they, they balance good. Friendship sloops originated in the Muscongas Bay area. It was one of the many similar sloop designs built all along the main coast in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They were working boats and they were, uh, they had history to them. They're a nice looking boat. A lot of fishermen would have a boat built to suit them themselves. They, they get to build it to, to maybe make it a little narrower, or a little, little shoulder, or a little deeper. Friendship sloops were used for hauling lobster traps as well as tending fishing trawls offshore. The boat was beamy and fast, so fishermen could get their catch to market quickly. It was a well-balanced sailor that could hold its course untended to let its crew sleep or play cards on the way home. Though its proportions varied, it was known for its clipper bow, curving shear, wine glass stern, and large gaff rig mainsail. The friendship remained in use until motors eventually replaced working sail. Uh, Wilbur Moss said the friendship sloop was a, was a, a sloop built in friendship by Wilbur Moss. <laughs> but uh, actually they, they, were, they were, in the days when they were popular, they were called main sloop boats. And a lot of them were built in friendship. Some of the original friendships were still working the coast when Ralph was growing up and he developed an interest in them early. But his real involvement in friendships began in 1961, when Albie Nelson asked Ralph to build him the 33-foot Hieronymus. I made the half model for Hieronymus, and I took the lines off the half model. I just made the model what I thought it should look like. I cut away all the wood that didn't look like the boat. And when he built the Hieronymus, he started inside the building, but when they got to the stern, they had to add a piece on the building so that it covered the stern. So, uh, and I think that piece is still there. The Hieronymus was launched in the summer, late summer of 1962. She wasn't quite finished down below, and we did a lot to change her rigging after that. That was his first friendship and the first sailboat that he built. He had built lobster boats before that, and he knew a great deal about friendship sloops. Ralph went around, there was one old one that belonged to Peter Richardson, but hadn't been launched for two, three years at least, but was up on the bank on the shore in, at, at Cranberry Island. And so Ralph went down there, took pictures and measurements, and, all, and that was built, that friendship sloop was built by Wilbur Morse, the master builder of friendship sloops. And uh, so that's one of the basic places that he got the shape uh, of the Hieronymus. I mean, Wilbur Morse was the master builder, but you can't, he didn't have an assembly line like the Ford Motor Company had. Wilbur Morse just did it by his own eye. So that's where the eye business comes in. And as far as I could see, that's what Ralph did. And he has a very good eye. L.B. Nelson's family still sails Hieronymus. After that, Ralph went back to building powerboats. But it wasn't long before the friendship sloop beckoned again. Nine years later, in 1971, local boat builder Jarvis Newman asked Ralph to help rebuild the 26-foot Venture, an original Wilbur Moss friendship. Interestingly, Ralph was not the first builder Jarvis approached. He first called his father-in-law and Ralph's teacher, Raymond Bunker. Raymond Bunker didn't have any work to do that winter, and he was going to, uh, Jarvis got him to, to restore that boat. Raymond went down to the shop first thing in the morning and, and looked at the boat. He says, Jarvis, he says, I can't work on that thing. So that night, Jarvis was on, at my doorstep, wanted me to come down and work on it. So I said, all right, if I don't get a boat to build, I'll, I'll come down. 
Well, if I get a boat, maybe I'll have to stop. And uh, so anyway, I went down and we restored her. And then Ralph was asked to restore another Moss boat, the 26-foot Amos Swan, owned by Ed Calvert. Ralph took it on, but the boat was a mess. It had been so cut up and so altered that Ralph could not even get the lines off her. So he built a new boat instead. So I took the lines of another sloop that I had taken off and uh, adapted them to the dimensions of the Amos Swan and uh, we built him a new, new boat on, that, on those lines. People bring their boat to restore and some, some of them are just, just not worth restoring. And there's no historic significance to them and, and the, uh, the shape is gone and, the, and the, uh, there's just nothing to work from. Amos Swan is an extreme example, but often when Ralph rebuilds an old friendship sloop, about all he keeps is the shape. Ralph has done much to revive interest in friendships and keep the design alive. And for that matter, he has improved the boat. His friendships pretty much keep the old lines, except the sterns on his are a bit fuller and more buoyant than the earlier models. More importantly, Ralph has changed the construction to make his boats stronger. There is one friendship that Ralph built that may be the most significant at least to the owner and to Ralph, the 28-foot Freedom. Its owner is Richard Dudman, former correspondent for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I covered the Vietnam War, and in the course of that, I was captured by the Viet Cong, and I held only a few weeks. I said to myself, if I get out of here alive, I'm gonna get a, have a boat and I'm going to name it Freedom, because it'll be, mean that I've got, had my own freedom to get loose from these people. When, when I did get loose, I went to see Ralph. Uh, I told him I'd really like to have him build one. One of the nice things about him was he, he came up with Hieronymus, his first friendship, and he s sailed over to Islesford and came up to the house and he says, how about coming out for a sail? So I went down there and he let me take the tiller and it really gave me a, a little lesson in sailing as well as a feel for what this friendship sloop can be like. One of the great memories I have is how he went out to his mother's uh, woodlot and found a nice straight tree for the mast and then he shaped it with an adze. He let me do quite a lot of the work on it too. And his son Richard, I remember when they were, had done the planking, they had uh, bungs to close the hole of, of where the screws were set in. Young Richard was down there underneath with a, a great big chisel, even them off. I, I did some of that too. All this focus on friendship sloops had not prevented Ralph from restoring or building other classic designs. Still, Ralph says he just built whatever came along. John Wilson is the publisher of Wooden Boat, the premier magazine of wooden boat design and construction. One of the most important things I think about Ralph's experience and background, and because he grew up around boats and yachts, he was able to observe how these boats behave. I think he was a keen observer. So Ralph's ability to take that understanding and, and make it into a design, if, it, if he was asked to design a boat, he could, and a good boat, and fast and comfortable. He could build the boats and he could sail the boats. He understood the boat, the, the hull and the rig, and how it moved through the water. Pretty much no matter how hard it was blowing or, or, you know, how steep the seas were. I mean, pretty much Ralph Stanley was the epitome of relaxation on a boat. He was completely in tune with what was going on and he made it look so easy.
In 1978, he took on the job of restoring the 36-foot Jack Tar, an R-class racing sloop built in 1916 and owned by Peggy and David Rockefeller. The restoration took all winter and spring, and by the time Ralph was finished, there was not a single piece of the original Jack Tar left. We wanted to keep the shape as, as near as we near as could, and by taking the part piece by piece and replacing piece by piece, why we were able to keep the keep the shape. And otherwise, we would have to take the lines off and 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 make new molds. And when you rebuild a boat, you just don't know how how far you got to go. You take one thing apart, and you find something else that's got to got to come apart, and you end up a lot more work than you thought for. Looking back, Ralph sees that he should have taken Jack Tar's original lines and built a completely new boat. But when he started, he thought he could save a significant part of the original. John Wilson first met Ralph when he was restoring Jack Tar. I went into his shop and he was working on the backbone, a, a renewed backbone for Jack Tar. And what I saw just in the backbone work that Ralph was doing, what he could do with an ads. It was so smooth, what he could do with that ads. It was better than many people could do with a plane. And it really introduced me to the nature of the man in a way that if he had been doing something else on the boat, if he had been planking the boat at that time, I wouldn't have realized what a gifted artisan he was. Then, in 1982, Ralph built the 28-foot catch Rose, based on Francis Harrishoff's Rosinante design. Ralph had repaired a badly leaking Rosinante before this and found several elements of her construction he didn't care for. So he changed them. He built Rose his way. She wasn't built down. She was uh, she was uh, built uh, sort of like on a skeg, where the where the the plank came right to a point. And uh, he wanted an engine in the boat, and of course the boat wasn't designed for an engine. So I uh, changed the the shape and, and built it down to to the keel, and and that gave me room to put the engine in. And uh, I changed the uh, the stern post design and, and put a shaft log in it. Instead of the, the square frames that Hershoff used, I uh, used a flat frame and split them on the bandsaw so they'd bend in easier. And that's the way we built the lobster boats and it, it works fine. Hershoff, Ross and Nantes, had broken frames and that's because they, they weren't split and, uh, and the the frames would break after a while, it was uh, too much strain on them. Ralph also laid the flat frames closer together than in the original design and boxed them into the keel instead of bolting them into the floor timbers. I remember feeling about Ralph that he, you know, he had learned a lot about what went wrong with boats because he had ended up repairing a lot of boats. If he saw a design that he felt could be improved, then he didn't hesitate to make that improvement. And it, it wasn't like, this is my sense of it, it wasn't like he knew better than the designer, per se, but he knew from experience that this might not work as well as if he did something a little bit differently. The new hull had a more of a wine glass cross-section than Harrishoff's design. Even so, its top sides looked the same as the original. This seems to have been Ralph's approach to building a boat using his restorations to learn what construction elements failed or succeeded. Ralph is deeply proud of every boat he ever built. He seems to know the fate of all of them, starting with his first, and he also knows the history of almost every boat he has restored. He says that boat building has to be long term. To make good boats you have to stick with it year after year, like all the old time boat builders he remembers did. And somebody wants it, wants you to build a boat. It, it's a challenge to, to do it, and uh, and you always try to to do it better. You know, every boat you build, you try to do it better. When Ralph designs a boat, he says 
it's uniquely his. The shape, the sheer, the way he puts it together. Ralph has stayed with Wood from the beginning. When he started, he was one of many. But over the years, others have retired or changed over to fiberglass till Ralph is one of the few still working in wood. I didn't spend an awful lot of time with him building, but I sometimes get something to get fitted into my boat, and I'd watch him work. It was like a, an accomplished chef in a kitchen, the way he did things with his hands, everything. I mean, everything it was just so well connected. As builder Jarvis Newman once said of Ralph, he's an absolute genius when it comes to wood. To Ralph, Building a wooden boat is the nearest you can come to something living. It has a spirit of its own, he says, and it's something you can understand easily. Sometimes Ralph is asked to build a boat exactly the same as one he built before, something that he says is impossible with wood. And this is a good thing, he says. But once he builds a boat, he doesn't want to build that boat again. In 2009, Ralph retired from boat building. Not that he has slipped into inactivity. This retirement has allowed him to pursue other interests, including to continue to build fiddles. He admits that fiddles and boats, with their curves and queer fits, have a lot in common. He claims he's not very good at it, but he enjoys playing with local groups regularly. Ralph continues to study and publish work about Maine's maritime history, as well as his community's history and genealogy, an outgrowth of his childhood interests. And he teaches, sometimes to school kids about local history. One time talking to them, it didn't go so well. He sensed right away that they weren't, that they were bored. And so then that's when he began to say, well, what's your name? And the fellow would say what his name was. Then he said, well, did you know that your grandfather was captain of this boat and his brother, your uncle, was captain of that boat and went all over the place. I mean, some of the captains from this area had long voyages about which he can tell you. After that, Ralph had those school kids. They paid close attention to everything he said. Now and then, Ralph teaches boat building. Unlike the earlier builders that he learned from, Ralph wants to pass his knowledge onto others. Ralph has taught at the Wooden Boat School in Brooklyn, Maine, west of Southwest Harbor, and at the boat building school in Eastport, far to the east. The reason? He thought it might, as he puts it, help keep the wood alive. Ralph has a reputation as a teacher of boat builders. This is, this is an important thing about Ralph. As much as he might have had to be um, careful about asking too much of the people from whom he was trying to learn something because they were protecting their own ways, he wasn't like that. I mean, he was very willing to share. He was never closed about his work and his skills. You know, I think that he realized that he was keeping something alive. And the key to his teaching? his skill as a builder. And the key to that? Ralph's oldest son, Richard, learned boat building from his father. What makes a good boat builder? A fellow that has a lot of common sense, has, has the ability to see the finished product before it's even begun. It has to be a jack of all trades. And I have to know a lot of different things to build a boat. 
takes a person that's, that, that has good engineering skills, and it takes a person that, that cares about what they're doing. It's as if Richard is describing his father, which he is. Been on the water a lot. He uh, grew up in a, in a lobster, you know, with a, his father being a lobster fisherman and, and knew, you know, a lot from that. And he, he was the captain on that schooner for 19 years. And, and he see a lot of, of different boats. He paid a lot of attention to things. Um, what made him a good boat builder was that he had those strengths that, that you needed for it. Loved it. And, and so I, I love it as well. Um, it, it's, it's my passion. I think that was his passion. He had a good eye for things as well. Well, you got to be able to see things in three dimensions. You got to, uh, you got to have a sense of proportion. And, I can usually look at a boat and and tell where the water line's going to be. I'm pretty close. Raymond Bunker could do that too. To me, a great boat builder is one who understands, first of all, what's beautiful. You know, that's that's one a person who has a sense, an eye for the sweep of the shear, you know, the, the turn of the bilge, the tuck below that. You know, all of those things, someone who understands how trees grow, realizing that the material in it, when it gets shaped, cut, shaped, fitted, and fastened in place, is going to have to live there for the rest of its life. It's going to have to rest there comfortably. The, perhaps the most important thing in a, in a boat builder's execution of his skill is that he understands what forces are going to be brought to bear on the hull. You know, what's going to happen when this boat is under sail in a very, very stiff breeze? Not just a little bit of breeze, but serious wind. So there's, so he has to have an, an aesthetic sense and a mechanical engineering understanding of what the structure is going to go through. Well, a lot of it is, is, is your eye, and, uh, but I, I do calculations too. I calculate the displacement and the center of buoyancy and for the sails, the center of effort, and the, the center of lateral resistance, and the formulas you can go by. And uh, so it, it's, it's some mathematics and calculations. And, as Ralph says, sometimes it isn't how well you build a boat, but how well you get around the mistakes. You can always improve. After Ralph retired, he passed his business to his son, Richard. Ralph makes this simple point about him. I think my son, Richard, is, is even better at, at uh, building than, than I ever was. There aren't many boat builders who will say that about somebody else, even their own children. It speaks to the ease with which he is uh, sort of approaching what he did with his life. Um, what he continues to do with his life. And Richard really is a great boat builder. You know, that it's, it's undeniable. Like Ralph, Richard started early. I always wanted to be a boat builder from the get-go. Yeah. There, no, there was no time ever growing up that I... I I just always wanted to be a boat builder. I didn't want to be anything else. When I was three years old, my father was out scrubbing the bottom of Hieronymus, which he stored out behind the house on the ways. And uh, I, went, I went up to my mother and asked my mother for my boots and, and a bucket and a broom so I could go out and scrub the bottom of the boat with him. But I, I, I'd want something to do, and he'd tell me to sweep the floor or, clean the shavings out of the bilge. Or, and then I, I got older, I could put bungs in. And then I, as I got older, I could put bungs in and cut bungs off with a sharp chisel. Basically, that's where I got my start. 
That's when I started, when I was probably four or five years old. Richard also learned his craft the way his father had. We, we learned by watching him do things, you know, and, that, and, and that's how we learned from him. You know, he wouldn't tell you what to do. Pretty tough that way. It was, but I think probably I, I became a better boat builder, a better designer in, interior-wise and whatnot from that because it just made me have to use my, my thoughts and figure things out. Ralph seems to have softened his approach to teaching from Richard's early days. And how does Richard respond to his father's comment that he's a better boat builder? I think that he means I'm quicker at it than he was, that I tend to be a little more fussier than he was about things. When I'm planking a boat, to, to, I like to make my plank lines look good. And, and it takes a lot of, of talent and experience. Um, and, 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 and a lot of eye. And, and you uh, have to stand back and, and look at it. And, and, and you have to look at it from different angles and different positions and, and, and get an eye of it. And like his father, Richard has begun teaching. In 2012, he received a Maine Traditional Arts Fellowship to teach an apprentice. Together, they're building a 19-foot, friendship-inspired sloop from the keel up. Richard is pleased with the results. He has an act for it. Um, he, he, he learns very quickly, does everything. He's, he's done every aspect of the building. He's coming right along and, and shows up every week. And it's really nice. It's, it's been nice for me. Very enjoyable. He's learned a lot of, of things that he'll carry on forever. And there is real evidence the tradition will carry on. Richard is now repairing and refastening Hieronymus, Ralph's first friendship sloop, which he launched more than 50 years ago. Things truly are coming full circle. In 1999, the National Endowment for the Arts awarded Ralph a National Heritage Fellowship for Excellence in Boat Building, recognizing him as a national treasure. Then, in 2013, the USS Constitution Museum gave Ralph the Don Turner Award for nearly 75 years constructing pristine wooden lobster boats, main work boats, and friendship sloops preserving America's maritime heritage for future generations. Ralph's modest about these awards, saying he's not doing anything different from any other boat builder he knew when he was a kid. He's just the one who's left. What is Ralph Stanley best known for is being Ralph Stanley, because he's a man who can do anything. You know, he's known for being an extraordinary man. It was kind of like what he was put on the earth to do to make something work well and work beautifully. There was a human being who was an artisan and an artist, you know, a boat builder, a great sailor, and a musician. Somebody who cared about not just boats, because lots of us can be very obsessed with boats alone, but he just, you know, he cared about it all. And the tradition of it, the aesthetic of it, When Ralph started, he was, as he says, one of many, no different from any other boat builder of his day. But he is different. He carries a unique combination of skill and understanding and passion for his craft. He does indeed have an eye for wood. The hope is that others like Ralph and Richard Stanley will follow. 
that the tradition of beautiful, well-crafted wooden boats will continue.